I was away on vacation and I was by a pool and uh, I bought one of those little round beds versus the regular chairs. And it was more expensive than just a regular chair, but it wasn't crazy. And I just decided to splurge one day with Bryn because a couple of people were coming up to me and we just, it just gave us a little bit more privacy. And my daughter said, what is a VIP? Because I guess there was a little sign that said VIP on these little beds, not just, not my bed, but just in general. And I, I had to hesitate as I said it out loud. And I said a very important person. I almost threw up because I thought, and she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, I don't even know what the hell it means. Because I said, what it means in practice is sometimes there's a private room or a stanchion or someone's paid more. Um, but they don't call first class on an airplane v VIP section. Because why is that person more important than somebody else? And because I chose that I wanted a shade and not to be roasting in the sun and I wanted a little privacy. Doesn't mean I'm important. It means I made that choice. If I order uh, a pasta that's over $20 versus one that's $6 doesn't mean I'm a VIP. It means I ordered a more expensive pasta. So I said to her, I don't like that term at all. I don't, it makes other people feel bad because then someone's saying, and this is kids. What's a VIP? Oh, it's a very important person. Wait. So if, if somebody else's parents couldn't afford to or didn't get one of these round bed chairs, they, their kid's going to think they're not important. I don't like the, I don't like that word. I, I'd like to cancel the term VIP. Oh, it's a VIP. What in the fuck does that even mean? a very important person. Who's not an important person? We've canceled so many things. Let's cancel VIP. You pay more money, you're a VIP. You're very important. Said who? Said some jerk off that you gave money to because Voss Waters, $10 at a fucking nightclub and you're buying $300 spending $300 for a bottle of vodka somewhere, you're a VIP. I just, it just occurred to me that I just think that that's a gross terminology and I'd like to cancel it. I don't want, because even like, for, yeah, friends and family. Okay, you're friends and family. You go there a lot. You may spend a little more money. You may be friends and family. Very important person is wildly offensive. Wildly offensive. It's very, I'm up here, you're down there. My guest today is actor, director, producer, Justin Baldoni. You might have seen him on the hit TV show, Jane the Virgin, as Raphael. Or you might know his work behind the camera, including the feature film, Five Feet Apart, Clouds, or award-winning documentary, My Last Days. Beyond making a name as an all-around filmmaker, Justin remains busy as a father, podcast host, and author. His work often tackles the culture of toxic masculinity as he aims to redefine what it is to be a man in today's society. Justin co-founded a production company called Wayfarer Studios and started a nonprofit of the same name aimed to serve the unhoused community in Los Angeles. I can't wait to talk through Justin's journey in entertainment, entrepreneurship, and sharing love for your community. You guys will leave here feeling inspired by today's show. Hope you enjoy. So how did you get into acting? Was that something you always wanted to do? Did you fall into it? Are you passionate about it? How, what is that part of your life? Um, I, I, I'm probably not going to give you these normal answers. You're, there is you no might, normal. You and if you've heard the show I, ever, there's no I, normal. Bunch of crazy so I, I, never, I, never, I never really thought that I was going to become an actor. I didn't have the self-confidence. I, um, I was a bit of an ugly duckling. Uh, my dad was in the entertainment business growing up. And it was just felt so far away from me. Um, so when I moved to Los Angeles, really it was for sports from Oregon. I, uh, <laughs> it, I took an acting class and I really liked it, but I honestly took an acting class because I had no idea what the hell I was going to do with my life. I didn't know I wasn't, I was either going to be a psychologist or an actor. I wanted to be a filmmaker. It was, that was what I really wanted to be. And then I found myself after a, a, pretty devastating breakup when I was about 19, 20, moving, I, I moved into this tiny office building. I slept on a couch in my dad's office. He had kept this tiny office. And in that building, there was a manager that asked me if I was an actor. And I said, no, but I'd, I'd be very open to be, as it turns out, he was hitting on me. Ah. Um, he became my manager. We ended up parting ways, but I started working right away. And wow. And I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I learned how to act on, on sets. Um, it was terrible. 
I doubt that. You have to have something to be to get I, a gig. I was I, think I was I just terrible too, but unique. I tried. I think I just maybe looked unique. I don't know. Um but I uh but I I learned and I um and really I I just knew I I knew I wanted to be of service in some capacity. Faith has been a huge part of my life. But when but now what I joke about when everyone asks me like did you always want to be an actor or a director or you know I look back and I'm like so much of this was really just a trauma response of my wanting to be loved and appreciated and valued and mm -hmm. seen thinking that oh if I got on TV then maybe all those people that were mean to me would appreciate me or right. if I just get you know if I just had that car or that so much of so much of my especially my early life was driven unconsciously by a lot of those things um, so I've just been unpacking a lot of that and it's informed the way that I work now and the things that I do and what I focus my time on. But are you passionate about acting now and being an actor? Do you actively work really hard to get roles that seem interesting to you? Are you oh, no, I stopped like, acting. So you're not acting anymore at all, period. You don't want to no. act at all. You no, 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 it's not that I don't want to act. I just, I'm somebody that, uh, so I, I, I started a studio. I raised a, a large amount of money and we're financing movies and television shows now. Wayfair, um, right? Wayfair Studios, yeah. And I, and I direct. So I, I haven't acted since Jane the Virgin. Which has been three, uh, three and a half years now. And um, there wouldn't be a role that you would create or direct, or you'd think that you'd be the best. There role. is, yeah, I am. I'm. Uh, there is a role that I'm going to take on uh, for a movie we're going to finance. Um, but but it's one of these things where I don't I don't wake up thinking about it. No, to mm -hmm. answer your question, it's not like it's a huge passion. It's more like there are days that I wake up when I feel like, oh, I'm drawn to it. And then there are days that I wake up when I'm much more drawn to the creative process of filmmaking or mm -hmm. simply producing or just writing. Or there are days when I just want to be focused on the business aspect of my work or the foundation. Whatever it is, uh, I, I don't have like a one thing that I just I get it. I really um, get it. I literally get it more than most people. I, yeah, I don't either. And I do just do what things, I... Bethany. Yeah, I do a lot of things, not because... You know, someone said to me today, do you want to um, continue with having a production company and really focus on that? And I know that a lot of people would give me money to do that. And I could do, and I say, I don't really want to do that. Like, I don't, I kind of just do what I want to do. And then if I really like it, I'll execute it. But if I don't, it doesn't matter how much money there is. I just don't do it. And it's so funny because people like you and like myself, people think that we have this big grand chessboard plan. I am aware of the board always. And I, but it's almost like, fantasizing in your mind like that will happen and then that will happen and this will happen and i am planning it but it's not really a plan it's sort of just like a mm. game in my mind does that make any sense yeah no no no, for sure i think of it i think of it a little bit like i always say i'm kind of a feather in the wind going wherever god takes me and so well, you are more spiritual about it than i am i'm like i don't fucking want to do that so <laughs> well I'm tired i think I that the that. <laughs> same principles i think the same principle applies i think that it is in many ways a game um, and I think this conversation also is like, we can't take the privilege out of it, which is like, how blessed, how blessed are we to be able to choose um, so that it's not feast or famine. Although I will admit that the feast or famine still lives inside of me and, and governs some of the rules, even though I have plenty, there's still this part of me that thinks I have nothing, uh, but that comes from having nothing, right? It comes. No, from I get it. Well, that um, comes from having nothing, but also you have the luxury and the privilege now of choosing because back then you had no choice you had to do anything i mean i had my 500 hundred dollar car with a cracked windshield and was broke oh, yeah. and was panicked and alone oh, and no yeah. family so you did all that to then now be able to say i don't want to do x y and z exactly and um i also think it lives in us you know generationally i you know half of my family is jewish and so i have you know the holocaust in me and um the great depression from my grandparents and what they taught my mom and scarcity and you know, I think that lives in us to a certain extent and informs some some of those things and and has made me like extra fast on the hamster wheel. I talk a lot about this with my wife, which is what is enough in this society? What is enough? When is when is it enough? How much money do I need to make? What do I need to how many Instagram followers? How many movies do I need to make? Is there a role that would make me feel enough? And when you dig into it, you don't you realize there is no number. There's no thing. Absolutely. No. Well, it's there all... could be a number. 
And then after that number, just because that's also part of the game, it's not really, it's not a number that really matters or really means that you're done. But then after that, the rest is gravy. You're playing with the house's money. You can choose to do what you want. That's, 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 and I mean, metaphorical money. Yeah. You're, you're, I'm, it's funny that you're talking about this because I'm at that place now. I've been successful. I just sold an apartment in the city and I keep taking things off the board that are very lucrative and that aren't even that much time to spend that I just, even the five seconds on it, I don't like it. Or the people that I have to work with, I don't like them. Or yeah. I don't like the way they work or their culture. And I just say no. And it's literally a, a lot of money. It's been millions of dollars in situations. And to say no is very liberating. And to say more is not more is very, very freeing. It sounds like you're protecting your time and your energy right now. Exactly. More than you are valuing making more money. And that's an exactly. important... It's a privilege to be able to be in that place to do right. that. And a really important step i think in all of our journeys when we really take a step back and you look at it time is our most valuable asset i say it all the time I, I, be it honest. is the one thing that we can never get back and that is ticking away and we have to be really mindful of how we are spending our time it's not time it's not that equation of like time equals money um no it's, not at all and it's I... far worse than that it's time is priceless well, and your relationship to time evolves because it used to be for me, and it still is in a way, I stack work. So I want to, if I'm putting some eyelashes on, I want to do five things that day, and then I don't want to do things for days. But it used to be that I would stack, then be with my daughter. So I was totally present with my daughter and totally present with work, but there was no time with myself. There's no me. It's just, you're doing that, you're doing that, you're doing this so you could do more of that. But there was no just me like being like a bowl of oatmeal, and I wanted that. No, You know... Because being doing me doesn't mean doing yoga, doing a massage. Like it just means like laying and staring at the television. Doing nothing. I don't. Yeah, it's very meditative, truthfully, as you know. It's hard. Um, it's, very, it's very hard to for people to do nothing. It's one of the things that's come up for me in my healing journey. It's antithetical. Doing nothing, right? You don't. You put those two kind of things together. It's a verb. What right. is doing nothing actually? Doing nothing. The, right. That's funny. And that's um, funny. And it's but it's really been important for me to practice that. That's funny. Because the Doing world tells something me, is the opposite of nothing. That's interesting. Because the That's world always thought. tells me like, hey, you have to be doing something because mm -hmm. I believe in a system, a patriarchal system, if you will, our, our worth is tied to our productivity. So if I'm not doing anything, I am, I am trained, I am brainwashed, I am, I, I've been built in a way in this system that tells me that I don't have value. So of right. course, I, I'm, why would I ever take care of myself? Why would you ever take care of yourself, Bethany? If if the world has told you by doing nothing, it means you're not being productive and you, you're you wasting your time, right? right so how are we valuing time is really what's important. Well, also, I know I'm you, you're very um, cause-driven, as you mentioned, and you work, you have a foundation, and philanthropy is important to you, as it is to me. Sometimes it feels like a sham because... It's just another transference of, of doing business. It's just not for profit. So while it's incredible and I'm so proud that we, we have a, an effort in Ukraine that's literally never been done before in history. It's unprecedented. Mm. It's, it's, it's so quickly for hundreds of millions of dollars of aid, but I've treated it like a business because it's so yeah. it doesn't. So sometimes my fiance will feel guilty telling me like it's a lot because you can't say that to someone who's saving lives and helping people, but he's seeing the tax that it takes on me. So you're giving, yeah. but it's still like, not a sham, but you know what I'm saying? Like you're still working. Oh no, for sure. That's why I think it's important to, to, to mix philanthropy with, with what I call secret service which is you are physically doing things on the ground that nobody knows about. You don't talk about it. You don't post it. You don't share it with anybody. Maybe your fiance, your kids don't even know, but there's a part of every human being that lights up when we are of service, mm -hmm. when in true service has no other benefit except for who that person is serving. It's not for you. Now, the way God designed us is that, yeah, it feels good to be of service. So we are supposed to do it. But I think oftentimes we can get disconnected from the actual cause and be on the ground. And sometimes it's been really helpful for me to actually just go and have a conversation with somebody who's unhoused again, like I did 10 years ago. And 
hear their story and their pain and what they're up to and see and connect with them and look in their eyes. And I'm like, oh, this is why I'm doing it. Or physically talk to somebody um, who I've helped or who I who needs help without ever making it a thing. That the tree re- falling, that, but no that, one heard it. But, but that's, and, and that's fall. the true test of the purity of it too, mm-hmm. which is like, oh, I don't, I'm not doing it for that. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for the sole purpose of helping this other person. And in return, God knows. Nobody else needs to know. That's what we've kind of fallen away from in this very like on demand, let's broadcast how good we are as human beings world. Um, oh, and so, yes. and so it can become, so it can feel like a business because again, you, you're literally having to run it like a business because that's how it works. But I think the thing that can then put fuel in your tank is, is doing the work that you would normally like have a team on the ground doing. That's what I, that's what oh, I've learned for me. Yes. And I have, but it's funny that you say that because I took a really big time celebrity to Puerto Rico and we had it, we had mu- hundreds of houses to bring crisis kits to. And this person stayed for four hours with one, one, one woman and held the whole group up. And I understand that that was their experience on the day, but we literally had hundreds of people in Cho to help the most people. So it's, it's, there is a balance in that because. Um, oh, well, that situation is totally different because yeah, you're, do, you're doing it for a reason and you have a, a it's a volume business time. i can't yeah. go help one pol- one person in poland right now oh, We're no 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 no, no. Yeah. yeah no no yeah. of course i'm just talking about when you get drained that's how you refill your time for yourself you're just saying for this yourself. is for your own private for moment yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, I no, no no yeah 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 i was speaking more about like you and i no i agree then, I, I agree then, i knew what you were saying but i yeah. it's funny it just becomes while i would also like to sit and talk to that woman in her house i would love to do that it's just yeah. not and that's why sometimes i feel cold because when i'm doing talking about it it doesn't you know what i mean you're not like being all touchy feely about it Thank at you. the end of the day okay, but so you but, get it but i th- yeah. i do think someone once told me that our world is designed like if you think of an army everybody has a purpose right so if we were designed to and everyone has a role you need a Bethany Frankel in order to create the the charity, the nonprofit that helps those millions of people to hire the people that are on the ground doing that. Indiv- like we all have our purpose here. Right. Right. And, and we can't start to, you know, something that I tell myself is like, Oh, I wish I was more of the other person. Yeah. I wish I was like, you know, I wish I was doing more of the work on the ground. I feel so disconnected, but in reality, right. like, okay, if there weren't a you, then that wouldn't be happening. That's what my fiance says. It's yeah. not, it's guilt. Because I, I wanted to be in Poland the first week and my partner was on the border and said, we have no phone service. You have to be doing all this. And I, I'm the sort of person that drives the whole opera. I'm the CEO yeah, of, of this course. whole thing. And so I said to my fiance, I'm not standing there. I'm not in the warehouse. He said, I don't think the head of Coca-Cola is putting Coca-Cola in bottles either right now. No. So you have to be where you're, so there's a level. That's just, I haven't talked about that. That's interesting. So a, but yeah. I want to hear about your philanthropy. So you're, I'm, you're. I'm not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider myself a philanthropist more than somebody who's just, you know, I, I grew, I was raised in the Baha'i faith. Baha'u'llah says that every human being must engage in an occupation or a trade, and that trade must be their form of service. So for me, I'm just like, I'm just always looking for opportunities to be of service with my privilege and my work. And I just so happen to be able to create some cool stuff in our business, um, which again, I battle with because I feel like I'm not doing anything and everyone's far more successful than me, but that's my trauma speaking. Mm -hmm. But what little I have done or to some a lot, I just want it to mean something more than just (laughs) for my ego or for my name, right? Um, For my brand, if you will, all because we're all brands now, I guess I want to, I want to, you know, I, I, I want to leave something behind that is more than just, me creating things selfishly or to look good or, um, or, in a well, do you, so. is that you have that filter? You don't, I, I want to know two things, what your project you're most proud of. And is that a filter you don't create or produce or direct a project or write a project if it doesn't, if it's not cause driven or I don't touch unquote. anything. anything I'm sorry? If, it's not, if it's not cause driven, I don't touch it. Okay. So give me, tell me one of, tell me the, what you think is the most influential or been the most impactful cause-driven project that you've uh, created? 
Oh, that's a great question. That's hard. Um, cause everything is different. Um, I started, I quit acting when I was 25 to, to make a documentary series called my last days where I traveled the country and I told the stories of individuals who were dying of a terminal illness because I wanted to help people remember that they don't have to find out they're dying to start living. Wow. Uh, because we procrastinate to become the people we want to be. We procrastinate to do everything. We always push everything off. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at this and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Why am I doing this? I was 25. I wasn't happy acting. I quit. I made that show for $4,000 an episode. I lost everything. My house went into foreclosure and I was the happiest that I'd ever been. And, um, and that show inspired uh, my first film, which was called five feet apart which was inspired by a friend of mine who had cystic fibrosis five feet apart before the world even knew what that was mm -hmm. staying five feet apart. And you know, that movie went on to make about a hundred million dollars around the world and it changed cystic fibrosis and awareness and um, saved lives and all kinds of stuff. And that's super impactful, but you know, then I made a movie called clouds about my other friend from that show, my last day, Zach, wow. that's on Disney. And we raised millions of dollars for osteosarcoma. And that was a very special project. But then also my my work with masculinity and trying to help men by help <laughs> and help myself recognize that we're enough as we are. Um, the, all of these things are 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 both. There's a double bottom line always. Of course, I want them to be successful so that I can make more of them. But I've always said, like when I when I first made that documentary series, my last days, my business partner at the time and I were looking at the YouTube comments. And it was in 10, almost 10 years ago on YouTube. And it, it literally broke Upworthy's website. It was how Upworthy really started. Mm, wow. 14 million views for a 22 minute video. And this was 10 years ago when everybody was watching cat videos and we're like, what is happening? And talk shows are calling us. And like, we had no infrastructure and we didn't know what we were doing. It cost $10,000 to make that thing. But one of the comments said, I had tried to take my own life multiple times and failed. I was going to take my life today and I stumbled on this video and I now know why I'm still here. Wow. If that's so the only it, thing you ever did in your life. And so it was the, if that was the, and that's what we've said. That's what, so that's what I've built all of my stuff on, which is okay. If that was it. Yeah. And I got one view. Yeah. It might've been a colossal flop to the business. Yeah. But how much is his life worth? Oh my God. That's amazing. And, and that's the metric by which I'm building my studio and we do everything. I mean, look, man enough. I, I had a great deal with Harper Collins. They, you know, paid me really good money to write the book. I write the book and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I tried to get out of it multiple times and give the money back literally. Mm -hmm. um, and we finally get it done. I'm nervous. I'm passionate about it. It's, it's here. It's for men. And Everybody's focused on it becoming a bestseller. That's mm -hmm. all anybody's talking about is yeah. how do we get it on the New York Times list? How do we get it on the New York Times list? And everything in me was like, this isn't why I wrote the book. This isn't why I do anything. This is the system. This is but this no, is, but more you can more people will read it if it's on the list, and you'll sure. get another book deal if it's on you'll get another but, book that people but, will read. But do I want to be on that hamster wheel, Bethany? And that's not a, and that's a question that we don't ask ourselves often is I don't want to do, they've offered me more book deals. I don't want to do another. I don't, I, I don't need to do all of it until it comes from a creative place and I'm ready to do it. I get like, it. This I was really all do. about, but I remember it all being about the bestseller list because it helps. Of course, it gets the message out more. It makes it, it makes it all these things. And I knew I had this feeling like I wasn't going to make the list. It's a very nuanced topic. It's about masculinity. Men are not, men are- I wouldn't uh, think it would make the list if I heard the concept yeah, of ahead of time because it's women who are you know, the target audience. So I- that's Well, men are the target audience of the book. No, in the world, I'm in saying the world. In, the lands, yeah, yeah. in this landscape and the talk shows you're talking about the book and in Us Weekly exactly. or whatever you're talking about. Yeah, it's women they're talking so, to. So that's why so I'm we, and so we, and so they do all this press for it and we're, you know, and, and, and I actually for a good month bought into the hype and I was so focused on trying to help this book become a bestseller. I'm reaching out to all my celebrity friends. I'm and doing all this and mailings. And and I'm like, well, this isn't what why am I doing this? Right. I just want to reach that one man. Yeah. And in many ways I was like, I have this feeling I'm not, and I think it'll be better if I don't. Right. Because I want to 
I want to feel that humility and be reminded of why I did this in the first place. So of course, interestingly enough, I write a book, it's a nonfiction book, undefining my masculinity. It's not a self-help book. And the feeling is probably somebody at the New York Times, a guy was triggered by it, he put it in the self-help category. Of course, I didn't make the list. Ironically, had it been a had it been a nonfiction book, I probably would have debuted at number two. It doesn't matter. The point was I didn't make the list. And right. Everybody was disappointed and I was fucking relieved. Because you know what would have happened? It. All then it would have been about staying, staying yeah. on the list. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's the hamster wheel, you said. It's the yes. hamster wheel. And I said, yeah. Oh, and now the book's had a life of its own. It's moving, it's touching people. I'm getting those individual messages from men. Sure, yeah. a lot more women bought the book. Women bought it for their men. Yeah. And everybody wins in the end. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. So, so, and it's a long tangent to, to answer. No, it's question. not. I get it. I get it. But, it but that's I how it. I think, that's how I'm trying to think about my place in this very strange intersection of art and capitalism. Well, you want to do things for the right reasons. You have to, it's like that philanthropy you said, doing on your own, that's a private moment. You want to yourself do it for the right reasons. Like Kelly, mm -hmm. I, my book is called Business is Personal because they're so intertwined. And you know, the blurbs, we, we need a blurb, we need a blurb, a blurb, a, 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 what's a blurb? You need a blurb, you need to call famous. Okay, I literally yeah. texted Katie, Katie, Katie Kirk and was like, send me a blurb. Oh, she's I a mutual friend, I love Katie. Yeah, I go, I go, I don't, she goes, what? I, I didn't read it. I go, just talk about me, say something, say something true and send me a blurb. Kelly Ripa, she was out dealing with something with her mom, I don't remember, I'll be, just send me a fucking blurb, Mark Cuban, send me a blurb! I need a blurb. They want a blurb. And then, then they want. Nobody but then, reads the books. Yeah, then, 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 right. I don't read the blurbs. And then in six months or five, May, sorry, in two months, they're going to want me then to tell Kelly Ripa to fucking tweet about it. But like, I'm not asking Kelly Ripa to tweet about this. I, that is where my line is, but I get it because, I, but I feel bad because I'm partners with the book industry people who it's so hard to push something and, and their asses are on the line too. So you, you're on the wheel. Everybody, you, you you're on the yourself wheel. You owe yourself to everybody. And by stepping on the wheel, you uh, you become a slave to it in many ways. It but don't beat you. yourself up. You only write books because it's a topic. You, you're writing books because it's a topic you want to pour out of you. And then you start writing it yes. and you probably get bogged down. But I only write books because I'm like, I want to say this now. I'm ready to talk. Yeah. You get a book deal and then you start talking. And then you're like, I, want, I don't want to hear my voice anymore. So you don't want to then promote it. You're like over yourself. Yeah. Well, time. for me, it's a little bit different, Bethany. I, I, I wish I had, I think 10% of your confidence for me, it is, it's deeply personal and the things I'm writing about, at least what I wrote about in man enough, um, I'm writing about masculinity in a way that a lot of men haven't talked about it because it's so hard, so personal from, from stories that have happened to me when I was young, embarrassing moments. Our, you know, things from our bodies changing that we never want to talk about to even a, a traumatic, you know, sexual assault that I experienced when I lost my virginity. These are things that men have never been able to talk about. No, so it's a absolutely. very, and, and also tying that into equality and how we should show up in the world as men um, with not just women and queer and trans people, but like with ourselves how to make this world a better place by becoming not just better men, but better humans. This is a very personal, hard thing because the whole point of writing the book was recognizing how deeply unhappy I was and how I was just wanting to be liked and loved and seen by other men and seen as enough in this world. And, uh, and by writing the book, it triggers other men, uh, and the exact same thing ends up happening where then I'm mocked and demonized and told that I'm a, you know, all of the things that they call men like me who are in touch with their feelings and emotional, which I believe you is mean the strongest like words like Metro or words like stuff like that. You oh, mean no, no, no. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about things that more, you know, uh, more, it's more derogatory statements than that. Okay. I mean, people can, I don't care if you call me Metro or any of those. No, things, but. You know, I, I think it's a, such a great, amazing topic because um, I read, you know, I have the information here about some of the things you talk about and some of the things you went through. But in talking about masculinity, it's such a stereotype and you're only allowed to, you know, men aren't allowed to whine and be as sick as women are. There was a man, I was at a spa and he was like, do you have a blanket? I get really cold. And I thought to myself, oh, that's not very masculine. Like, why isn't a man allowed to get cold? Like, I'm always getting cold. It's such a double standard in yeah. so many different areas where 
men have to act more um, stoic Impervious. and hardcore. Yeah, hardcore uh, because they're not allowed to 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 be vulnerable in the same way. So where does that go? Where does that go? That's got to be trapping. And where does you know, it go? It turns into anger. It turns into yeah. frustration. It turns into the reason men are so violent. It turns into you know when we can't cry. Where where does that go? It just goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until one day the well bursts and explodes. Well, that brings up the Will Smith thing, and it brings up. I want to talk to you quick, not quickly, but about the Will Smith slap, but also the conversation that he had with Jada when you know she was like, "You knew about August, the guy who I guess she was having." an affair with and Will was sitting at the table and you may not have seen it, but he was just like, Oh yeah, I knew about it, but it felt like degrading. Like he had to be like, yeah, I knew that you were sleeping with somebody else like at a table as if she was talking about something that they should be able to just talk about in front of millions of people. And you know, she was like, it was, it was just this weird conversation and it didn't seem the stereotype of masculine for him to just sit there and be in a discussion with Jada about the other guy that she was hooking up with and that he was presumably aware of it and what this like triangle was with them. Mm. And then I connect that to him sitting next to Jada and standing up and, and slapping another human being. And, you know, that that's, that's a man saying that he's defending his woman and that he has to protect his family because he's a man. And I'm just curious what you think of that, like the whole thing. Honestly, I think uh, I don't really. I might say it might not be cool, but I don't really want to comment on it because I feel like here. Here's what I can tell you: there are so many layers to this conversation that I don't know if two white people can can um, can really enter and have an opinion about. With the exception of, uh, we know that going up on a stage and slapping somebody is not right. That's right. very, very clear. But you're talking about, you know, when I when I look at the situation, I'm looking at a mul- from a, from multiple standpoints from a, from a place of the way we have devalued black women in our society forever, and how very few people stand up for them. To also um, the the need for men in general, let alone black men, to prove their masculinity. I mean, there are so many systems at play that intertwine here. And that mm-hmm. intersect into this um, that I I don't really have a a view on it other than I wish I I I've always loved Will Smith and I wish it didn't happen. No, I, wish, I love that I you had that. that um, I, but, I love that you bring up that it's two two black men in that it's, perspective. It's really just a nuanced conversation that that honestly I, I just don't think I just don't think as white people we really have the frame of reference to be able to unpack it. Because we have not lived in any of the experiences that these people have, especially the black woman. Um, okay, so Bradley so. Cooper gets up on the stage and slaps Brad Pitt. That that could happen. It could happen as much as this happened. It could, no? but we do. I do have to. I mean, I think we do have to look at also, like you know, there are acts of white violence and things like that that happen all the time. Um, you know, the conversations I have is, you know, the second that that it's around black folks, then it becomes this whole thing. Um, And there are, again, there are just, there are centuries of trauma that exists (laughs) underneath all of these things. Oh, absolutely. And it's just really hard. So again, it's, it's just, it's so much more nuanced than like, should he have done it? Should he have not? Because also, yeah, you're bringing up stuff that I'm not an expert on, like the situation that happened with them. I don't know. Right, you didn't even know that. Yeah. I I, I know. I mean, I've, I've, I've known about it. But what I can tell you is that in our society, here's what I can speak to. In our in our world, in a in a patriarchal <laughs> uh, fantasy land that we're living in, I can tell you firsthand that there is a a rage that happens deep down in every man when he feels as if he is being emasculated. Right. Which I believe is not a real thing. I don't believe it's possible for one to be emasculated because masculinity is not something that can be taken away. Your femininity can't be taken away. I can't effeminate you. You're no, but I can feel masculine because I'm so tough, and that's the the constructs that have been created. But I couldn't emasculate you, Bethany. 
Um, How could you emasculate me? Why is it that, why, why can masculinity be taken away? Why does my masculinity oh, have no, to be Oh, no, I've had proof? someone say to me, how does someone handle it? You're so tough. You should soften up a little or something like that. And that, yeah, why? that because, makes me feel less feminine. Well, but no, but here's the thing. The reason they're saying that to you is because of how you're going to make someone else feel that's a man. You should Oh, I get it, but it's up, still, right? I still feel that feeling. I can understand how they, people use the term that a man can feel emasculate. I understand what that means. It's just the same I can way. understand it too, but I think the system, the, the problem is we're talking about an overarching idea that one's masculinity Oh, can be, be taken proven. fair. Totally. And it's got and, many different definitions and, and terms and, to it. And if I am going through my life raised in this system that tells me that every day I have to prove my masculinity, how am I going to act? I'm going to be in a state of fight or flight. I'm going to be ready to fight. My nervous system is always going to be on. I and I'm it. not going to be able to take feedback from anybody. Yeah. The second somebody tells me that I can do better at something or that I failed at something, my defenses are going to go up and I'm going to have to prove myself. Right? We've seen this a lot um, with white fragility as an example in the conversation around race with men and women. We don't want to be, we, we don't want to be racist. Right, so we get all super defensive because God forbid we unconsciously said something or did something that hurt this other person. Right, like we don't, we can't be bad. Well, imagine as a man moving through your life, knowing that anywhere you go, you must prove your worth, your value, your masculinity. Uh, because if you don't, right, we got, we want to go back to the old days, like to primalness. Someone can take your woman. Someone can kill your kids, all of that stuff. Well, today, it's just about value. Today, it's about I need to prove my worth so that I'm seen as enough, that I'm seen yes. as a man. I get that. And I also get that the undertow of what could have been going on, and it could have been the perfect storm that went on to get up to that stage. But I don't, when I go to the supermarket and I encounter 100 different people, they all have their own undertow. And if I'm only in a supermarket where there's oh, yeah, only 100 sure. African Americans, or you know, then they all have their own undertow, but people can't just act out on that. And I think it talked about Hollywood. So many things went Privilege, on. I think it's Hollywood, all of it. There's an Hollywood. intersection. There's an a, intersection of all of it. I think it's just interesting. a woman needing to be defend a woman, not just a black woman, a woman needing to be defended by a man. Entitled Hollywood. Um, Yes, rage and things going on. Put it all and in a pot. Put it all I, in a pot and mix it together. Yeah, I think it's an and interesting you, soup. So I think I like you talking that. about it because I but, think but, it's interesting. But just to my point, Bethany, that's what I go back to is the only thing that I can share from my personal perspective is knowing what it feels like when my masculinity is being challenged and knowing that I have done, and which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, that I right. have over the course of my life said things and done things and acted in a way that I didn't want to act like because I felt like I had to puff up oh, my chest and, you and do, prove my worth. Oh, and you do. you should speak on it because you have a better perspective well, than most people. It's but that's well, every man has that perspective, right? Every man knows knows the feeling of being challenged and needing to step up and puff out their chest and do something True. performative to earn that back. And then if you layer in actual physical abuse, being young and seeing that, you have again this pers this this melting pot of all of these traumas that coexist to form this unique situation. But that is the experience of many men. Many men have been taught that they solve their problems with their fists. Right. You're not talking about the what. You disagree with the what. You're just con talking about the oh, why. Oh, I'm not talking about the issue at all. I'm talking what? about what's underneath the, the issue, well, which kind of relates back to masculinity in my book, which is well, we all, we yeah. all are told every single day that we have to prove our masculinity. And yeah. my point is that I don't believe emasculation really exists because I don't think you can take one's masculinity away. I think yeah. it's perception. And I think that's how we've been raised. I think that you even admitted yourself, you, what you what you talked about when you said, oh, well, why does that, that's not very masculine. That man doesn't want uh, a blanket. It's, that's right. called internalized misogyny. Yeah. Okay. And women experience this, this too. Bell Hooks, the late great Bell Hooks, who was one of the most prolific black feminist authors, writes about this. That in a system such as this, women experience internalized misogyny mm -hmm. as well, totally. which then reinforces the need for us men to be this way. Because when we're yes. getting it from men and then we get it from women, well, how the hell are we going to ever change? True. It's so interesting because my fiance had a different feeling when he first heard about the slap than he did 
a day later. It was like lasagna the next day. Like it just was different. He first was thinking like if someone said something bad about his mother or someone around him, how he'd feel that rage yeah. inside and how to, you have to do something about it and pan your chest. But obviously intellectually knows that it's wrong. I think it's a, I think this is why it's so provocative, this particular issue an incident because it's bringing up so many things that have nothing to do with celebs and bullshit pop culture, just that have to do with human beings. Uh, and so many, so many things going on. So that's the way why, that's I would why look I asked at, you. The way I would look at it, Bethany, is that it's a Rorschach test. People are going to see what they see. Yep. Totally. And, Very interesting. And that's how I kind of look at what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but what I saw is I saw, I saw myself. I saw I saw men that I loved. I I saw the I saw I saw the pain of the people in the audience. I felt I'm a, I'm an empath. I felt everybody. Mm -hmm. And but that but that's how I also move through life. Yeah, <laughs> that stuff that stuff happens every day. This, we we just saw it in a way that most people have not experienced it from people that they would not expect it from. But this happens every single day, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course. And yeah. so now it's in our faces and we have to look at it and wonder why, why was our reaction the way that it was? But I don't think we can have that conversation without also including all of the unique individual traumas that exist. Race and gender. And I that, love it. It's amazing. Wow. Well, that's an, I love I'm glad I asked you. See, you didn't have an opinion, but you had an opinion. So the last thing I wanted to ask you was your rose and your thorn of your career. That's so funny. Every single, every day, every night, I ask, we, my wife and I talk to our kids about their roast and their thorn of the day. Mm -hmm. We do it too. Um, it's funny because I, uh, we always used to start with rose and then I was like, you know, I'm going to start with my thorn. I want to end with my rose. Mm -hmm. We my can thorn? add to the kids, the petal is like, a, we just made it up. The petal is like a thing that you'd like to see happen or like a, mm. you know, a goal or a dream or something. So my rose and thorn of my career thus far, I feel like I'm at the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. um, I would say my, I would say my thorn isn't an event or a thing. I would say my thorn has been my, my, my giving in, my allowing the unconscious need to be seen and valued to accelerate the hamster wheel, like to keep me on it, to keep me creating when I could have very well stepped back and said, no, I've done enough for this month mm -hmm. or I'm, I need to go to sleep. I think that I have um, fallen victim to that system that only measures worth via productivity and just kept going and prided myself in many ways on being a machine. I used to get so puffed up and feel so good about myself when people were like, dude, how, you're like a, how do you do this? You're like mm -hmm. a robot. You're like mm -hmm. a machine. How do you keep going? And I would feel amazing when someone said that. But machines break down. Machines do not live forever. Mm -hmm. And my body started breaking down. I get it. And I started feeling the weight and the pressure mentally and physically. And I don't pride myself on being a machine anymore because a mach machine isn't human. Mm -hmm. As men and boys, we've been taught that we need to be more machine-like than human-like our entire lives. When in reality, we need to be more human-like. Rest is important. Doing nothing is important. Peace is important. So that would be my thorn is for years and years and years, not listening to my body when it said stop. Not listening when my kids needed me and I was like, no, no, let me send one more email, mm -hmm. which still happens. Yeah. I'm not perfect. Yeah. That's my thorn. And yeah, it's I an know. existing thorn that I'm going to constantly be trimming and working on and trying to pull out over the course of my life. Yeah. I would say my rose, it might not be a great answer for you, but here's what's coming up. This is what I feel in my body. I would say my rose is acknowledging my thorn. Oh no, I, that's totally good. I would say that my rose for my career is acknowledging that I have that thorn mm -hmm. and being aware of it so that I don't let it drive me. Cause I could very easily have the type of personality where I wake up when I'm 85 one day and I've accomplished so much and I've made millions of dollars, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. And I would have missed my life because I was so focused on 
the producing aspect of it. That is the value that I see in recognizing the thorn and that would be the rose. That's amazing. Wow. Well, it's been so great to meet you and to talk to you and to go on this little journey that yeah, you know, thank you nowhere where I thought we'd go. So that's what I love about it. And it's great to talk to you. It's so nice to meet you and good luck with everything. And thank you for doing all of your work from that high level place. And I hope. Oh, you thank you. I hope thank uh, you. every once in a while getting your hands dirty will reinvigorate you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, it's so good to talk to you. Well, have a great day and love thank to you your family. Me. Thank you, dear. Bye. Justin is so kind and gentle and interesting and uh, opinionated and thoughtful and I really enjoyed the conversation a lot. It, uh, every conversation is so different and it, it invariably goes in a direction that I never knew it would. But uh, I like talking to people who uh, dedicate their life to service but still have success from, how do I explain it, have success from like what other people perceive as a superficial metric. Meaning he's had commercial success, but everything that he does is of service, which I really, I think you can do great things and still be successful and profitable. Like it's what a great, isn't that the perfect convergence um, in someone's life? I'm really glad that I asked Justin his opinion on the Will Smith saga that continues because while when it first happened, I did think about the joke, the undertow, the, the subtext, the meaning, the anger, the preamble, the history that we don't know about either between them um, and making jokes, etc. It also, Chris Rock handled himself with grace and dignity. That needs to definitely be said. But you know, I'm not a black man and I don't know what that feels like. And I don't know what Will Smith is going. I don't know what so many of us are so appalled and outraged by what happened that we're not thinking about what happened before. Because, you know, when you take a situation too far, when you push something too far, you close off the conversation. Meaning, I've said this before, had Will Smith gotten on stage and won his award and said, I just want to mention that I think what Chris said was probably unintentionally, but definitely hurtful and disrespectful because alopecia is this and, uh, you know, he doesn't have to go into his whole life and his back history with his wife and infidelity or whatever's enraging him that we don't even know about, but he could have said something and then the conversation would have been about alopecia and Chris Rock would have not been in the, in the best part of that dynamic. So you can flip things upside down by what you do. So while it's great to have the luxury of thinking about all of the things that go into who somebody is when they do something and have compassion for that, you know, are we, what about Jesse Smollett? Not that that's the same thing. Are we having compassion for what he's done? Are we having compassion for Harvey Weinstein or Matt Lauer or Roman Polanski or Kanye when he took away Taylor's award or Mike Tyson when he bit off uh, Evander Holyfield's ear because Michael Rappaport brought that up in his podcast. So how much, how much license are we giving to people for what's going on ahead of time? I mean, Megyn Kelly, of all people, was talking about the privilege and how people got a $140,000 gift bag. So it's kind of hard to think about the plight of Will and Jada with what's going on in the world. Everything is relative. I'm sure his pain is as real as someone else's, but it's hard when you're walking out with a $140,000 gift bag to think about, oh, poor Will and what he's been through as uh, an Oscar winning man whose wife has had an affair and who is a black man and what that has entailed. So it's just hard. You have to conduct yourself in a certain way unless you're certifiable. Like, you know, you have to, you can't just do what you want. Sometimes I want to be a bitch. Sometimes I want to, you know, slap somebody. Like I literally, sometimes you're like, I, I would like to get into a fire right now so I can curse somebody out. You feel that. You feel that at the, you feel that if you haven't slept, you feel that if you're PMS, you feel that if you have menopause, you feel that you're at the fucking market, you've been driving hours, you work five jobs, you're exhausted. You feel that. You just can't act on it. So while it's interesting to bring up what's going on with someone, they didn't create a space where we could think about that because you just can't act irrationally. So that's what I have to say about that. 
So anyway, uh, thank you for listening. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And tell me your rose and your thorn for your career uh, or your, your life, whatever you want. So have a great day and thank you.